by men. But it came through revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So much in here. But I, and I, I highlighted and I circled some words in here that I really want us to. Sometimes when you read a, a King James Version, there's some words in there you're like, Ugh, I don't really understand what that word means or I don't use that word. But it, it also kind of helps us sometimes because it's concise. And then you read the New Living or you read the Living or you read these paraphrases and it's the thoughts. But it may not necessarily contain the original language. And so what I do is I, I outline or I highlight the verbs and the nouns and I leave out the conjunctions or I leave out these words and you really go, okay, so Paul's trying to make known Gospel preached, not man. Okay, I'm getting it. I'm starting to understand this. And he says, for I didn't get it from man, not received from man, nor was I taught it. But it came through revelation of Jesus Christ. Once again, to intro the book a little bit, for those of you who may, maybe didn't hear last week, Paul is starting off this letter a little differently because the Judaizers have already made their way into this, this church that is not in Israel, this is in what we would call Turkey today. It's in the middle area. Galatia is the middle province area of, of what you would call central Turkey today. And there were five or six churches, maybe those cities. The New Testament highlights a lot of those cities. If you do go do a tour of Paul today, you will go to western Turkey, and you'll go from a boat, and you'll get to some of these churches that are still in the, um, the sites are there. You're like, oh, I want to go to Ephesus, or I want to go to, um, you know, Iconium, or whatever. Some of those cities are off limits, and some of them you can go see to this day where Paul was. But he's trying to help these these Christians that are being told they must go back to Judaism. They must. You, it's great that you guys came to Christ. However, because you're not Jewish, you need to start respecting the traditions of our fathers, and you need to go back, and you need to keep the traditions, and you keep the law, and all these things. Well, here's the newsflash. The guy writing the letter is the most, to quote some sermon at some point I heard, the most Jewy Jewish guy there ever was. Paul is the tops. He's the most Jewish. He's the most qualified to tell these people, guys, that's not what Jesus said. Well, Paul, you haven't even come into Jerusalem and been taught by us. You haven't even put yourself underneath the apostles' leadership. Well, there was a purpose for that. There was a reason for that. Paul aggressively persecuted the church. Paul was on his way to basically authorize death or at least bring Christians back to be tried for blasphemy, blasphemy, and many had been killed. And so can you imagine the apostles are a little afraid of this guy? It's a little awkward to have Paul inside your, um, your meeting or your synagogue or wherever they were meeting in Jerusalem at these many house churches. One commentator says, it's a little like Hitler coming into your synagogue in 1945. It's a little awkward, right? A little awkward. Hey, guys, I've converted to Judaism from whatever I was over in, in uh, the, the Christian or whatever, whatever Hitler was. I don't know what he was, but whatever he was, if he showed up in synagogue to hear the Old Testament scriptures read, uh, he would have either been lynched or shot or they all would have run. They would have scattered. So that's kind of how Paul, like a fresh Paul coming into Jerusalem, would have been received. So we have this kind of background. Not only was his conversion um, not something that was man-made, his apostleship was something that Jesus actually gave him. Sometimes revelation comes off like something mystical or something that only a few people ever get or, oh, only apostles can have that or, you have the gift of apostleship. I've, I've heard people call themselves apostles today. Um, that's an interesting terminology for somebody today. However, Revelation in general, the book Revelation, is all about Jesus. The book Revelation is, some people call it Revelations, plural. Um, the book should be called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what the book should be called. So... It's about revealing the plan. The plan was always Christ. The plan was, was Christ when Adam messed up. The plan was with God's foreknowledge before Adam messed up. So revelation is great. Revela like somebody uh, spending time with Christ and, and Christ revealing things. There's nothing weird about that. There's nothing mystical about that. Now, if somebody goes, well, 
uh, a bunch of us went out into the desert and we started doing, we started eating magic mushrooms. And the revelation that came to us uh, doesn't really jive with the gospel, but we're all sort of on board with it. That's not revelation. That's a trip. And that's what you get at a Grateful Dead show, 1965. That's all we're talking about. That's not this revelation. This is a message from Christ to Paul. It's the exact same message that was going on in Jerusalem. There was no difference. Peter and John and James, the brother of Christ, who converted after, these the, the, the gospel of Christ was the same. These two paths had not crossed yet. Uh, Paul says in verse 13, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Transformation. This is a true transformation. This is a true convert. This is a true 180. What does it mean to, to repent? To go back to what Jesus told you in the first place, if you've been off track. Or in Paul's case, ignorance. Hey, I, I, I didn't know. I People always uh, wonder, you know, you read Acts chapter 9, 10, 11, and you start to get this history of when this happened. It's definitely not Acts chapter 2. Because when Christ left uh, Peter and these apostles, when he left them uh, and went to heaven, he, he gave them the gift of the Spirit and the church launched. But chapter 9 seems like, well, I could read that in 15 minutes. It was years. Some commentators say that Paul converted three years after Christ. Some say as many years as seven. It was quick in the scheme of life, but it wasn't right away. Paul was aggressively persecuting the church. That's what he's admitting. He's telling these Galatian, these people, hey, guys have done horrible things. We all have. We all have done things we're not proud of. We've all, we all have sin. We all have skeletons in our closet, but he's putting it out there. Guys, I wouldn't be giving you a non-Jewish gospel if there was one. Judaism led us to Christ. You, you do not go back to the thing that, that Christ was born out of. Christ, there was the law that no one could keep. Christ kept it. Christ fulfilled the law. He died and rose again and gave the church the Holy Spirit, the, the real fuel of all of it. How Christ was raised from the dead, Holy Spirit. And so it's it's... You know, sometimes you can read these five verses and go, just kind of glaze right over them. But there's so much history here. There's so much like, what, what's the motive here? Well, the motive isn't to advance in Judaism anymore. The motive's not to become the greatest uh, Pharisee that there is. The, the, some people say Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. Other guys go, he was headed for the Sanhedrin. Um, and sometimes they say that because they're trying to figure out if he was married or not by the, some of the terminologies. Um, and those guys would have been married. Um, whether or not he doesn't, he doesn't, he, he alludes to stuff that I can see where he'd pull that. Like he clearly had a wife and maybe cause she was like, Ooh, we're going to be a big deal in the country club of Judaism in Jerusalem. If you could get to that, that spot. And, you know, I've got the, the rising young star in the law firm, if you will. I don't know if you guys ever saw the firm. Um, but like if you're in the firm, if you're in the, the Pharisee group, like Tom Cruise was in that movie, when you go against them, it's pretty much death. That's what. That's pretty much what happened in the movie. That's what would happen to Paul if he would have immediately gone to Jerusalem. They would have come after him. How do I know this? Because when he did get there, they immediately came after him. To be lowered in a bucket out of a window and get out of that town. Paul was never going to be okay in Jerusalem. He was never going to be safe in Jerusalem. So what's the motive? I advanced in Judaism. I was I was headed to be basically as high at, or close to as high as you could get. So what happened, Paul? When it pleased God, who had separated me from my mother's womb and pulled me through his grace. Not through Judaism, not through advancement, not through anything he could have accomplished. Paul could have accomplished anything. Paul was that. He was a driver. He was a doer. He was a church planter. He was oftentimes alone. But it pleased God to take this guy who had blood on his hands, guys, and make this guy the apostle to all of the non-Jewish people. I mean, there's a hilarious irony there. Everything about the guy sets up well to be the best Jewish pastor ever. And God's like, no, 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 no. I got a better plan. You're going to Turkey. 
and ain't that tasty where you're headed. So I didn't even think that was going to be funny. Um, but he called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him to who? The Gentiles. Once again, not on Paul's radar screen five minutes before Jesus blinded him on the way to Damascus to persecute the church. Not on his radar screen. There's a last job Paul would have ever dreamed of having on his way after he had the arrest warrant and the death warrant on the way to Damascus. The last job. You could have asked Paul, what's the one thing you think he'll never do? Church planter for the way in Turkey, Corinth, Rome. No, no, no. Judy, you guys have to understand if, you, if you're Jewish, what Jerusalem means. It's like, it's the life, it's the blood. It was where the temple was. The temple was up at this time. The temple, because of Herod, who was had an interesting interesting uh, history, uh, that temple was unbelievable. It was it was it was far it was advanced uh, even in the day uh, of uh, when Christ was born it was it was still being worked that was being worked on for so long that these people were there was a pride there was a it's like wow this is amazing so God calls me reveals His Son to me that I might preach Him to the Gentiles I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood what does this mean. He didn't immediately run down to Peter and James, the brother of Christ, and all these guys and be like, hey, before anybody throws stones at me, I have some really great news. I am with you guys. Are they going to believe that? I don't know. The guy that the guy that prayed over Saul look, was agonizing and asking God, like, are we sure we can trust this guy? <laughs> the God, I know I'm talking to you, but can we trust this guy? Wouldn't it make sense that he was like a plant? Wouldn't it make sense that he was like, the, like a like a like a sleeper cell, yeah, it would. It absolutely would. And so God takes Paul and humbles him a little bit and says, "Hey, dude, you're going to Arabia. You're going to the desert. You're going to the wilderness." Paul didn't immediately go to Jerusalem. He didn't immediately go talk to Peter. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Now, between that verse, if you correlate the history, Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 25, where Paul lays this whole thing out, it's abbreviated. It's quick. You, you might read it and go, oh, no, he did immediately go. That's why he's writing this. He's telling everybody else that didn't know, I went to Arabia for three years. So it's very important. This, this is all part of why what he's saying should have that much more punch why the motive is there, and who gave him the motive. So there's no doubt there was a serious call on his life, but wouldn't you think the most predictable action for Paul was to go immediately to Peter, immediately to the guys, and be like, you guys are the only ones on earth that I know of that exist like this. A few years after the fact, church is rocking. Church is going. Um, it's about to start freaking Herod out. And so things are about to start getting heavy. In Jerusalem, but at this point in time, there's how churches, these guys are pastors now, they're teaching the word. If it was me, I'd be like, God, please let me go. Well, please let me at least go cry and apologize to these guys. I'm telling you, people, like as good as they can get in this life, as good as a person can grow and mature and all these other things, there's still history, there's still mental, there's still things up here that are like I still have a static. I still have a sensitivity. I, I don't know if I could talk to Paul. When I look at Paul, I think of Stephen. That's what Peter probably was thinking in his head. When I, when I, when I think of you, Paul, we're never going to be best friends, guys. And you know what was great about that is that it pushed the church to ultimately where we're standing right now. Think of how far we are, Sioux Center, Arizona, from this place. If, Paul, if they just would have centralized and just be like, hey, let, I'll hit Judea. Uh, I'll hit Galilee. I don't even have to be part of Jerusalem. Just let me stay in Israel. Let me stay in the land, the promised land. No. So Paul is on his way. Verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. This is, you know, once again, it's in chapter nine of Acts, um, but you're, you're not going to get this gap except for explained here. Acts chapter 9 details this entire story. And if you were a detective, 
If you were trying to figure out this guy's motive, this is where you would set your trap. The last thing you'd think is that this guy is headed now to Arabia. That this guy is headed now to the to the to the desert, to the wilderness, which is interesting because God has done a lot with a lot of people in the desert over the years, including his son, uh, who was tempted in the wilderness. Something about the middle of nowhere where you know you have no prayer to survive without God, right? I mean, that's where the Israelites were. There's, there's not one of them. There's not 10 of them. There's hundreds of thousands of them. And God fed them honeycomb cereal. We call it manna in the old Bible, in the, in the Bible. But he also gave them meat. He gave them quail. And I have been to some of this area. I've actually walked on some of the soil and it is desolate. It is as desolate as Yuma in some ways, shapes and forms. And, and it is not to knock Yuma because they do have a little river running next to them. But it's better now than it was then. Like it's got more trees and, and, uh, and irrigation than it did even then. It, it, there's nothing out here. There's nothing in the Syrian desert um, that you can see. So in this case, he says, uh, now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. I went, I did go ultimately. The Lord told me and led me to go talk to these guys. You can read about it in Acts um, the middle part of Acts kind of has the, like, how are we going to handle people that don't want to get circumcised? How are we? There was some organization, but it was pretty organic at the beginning. And so as, as, there, as it's growing and as we're adding and adding, we need to have some order. We need to, to lay down, hey, you're going to handle this area. You're going to be the pastor over this church. There had to be some order, but it didn't start off with a budget. It didn't start off with a marketing campaign. It started off with receive the Holy Spirit and let the Spirit of God lead and he has led to how many people are saved i mean literally millions and millions and millions of people from a few hundred with with no budget with with nothing and with paul aggressively coming after them until this con conversion it says afterward i went into the regions of syria and cilicia not areas that he would have wanted to go to not areas that would have been highly like well that's a great area there's no churches up there it's the kind of thing where, where, where you, you're a franchisee and you're like, oh, I want a Chick-fil-A. And they're like, awesome. We're going to have you go out to Coolidge and Florence. Well, I wanted to be in the city. Well, sorry, there's already enough Chick-fil-A's and you're low on the totem pole. It's a good area. It's a growing area. It's going to be big one day. Coolidge and Florence, not so sure. But in this case, Syria, so let's say, yes, lots of people are going to live there someday. And I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. Probably a good thing. No social media, no pictures. What we would do uh, in the old security world uh, at the, um, I think at the East Campus was somebody would be, um, would get tipped off and some guy would be like, like trying to maybe take his kids after a court order. And so we'd take a picture of the guy and we would shoot it out to all the security guards. Well, you could do that, but there was nothing back then, but just a letter, just writing a letter. So he was unknown to the churches of Judea which were in Christ, but they were hearing only he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy and they glorified God in me. So many awesome things in this. Paul wanted these Christians that he's writing this letter to, he wanted to, them to understand his motive. He wanted them to understand his qualification. Sometimes when you write a letter like this to this honest um, don't know much new Christians, they could receive this letter and they could say, wow, that's an incredible testimony. Some of them would be like, you haven't been sanctioned by Jerusalem. We're not going to listen to you. There's nothing that you can do. Have you ever tried to just like agonize and stress, worry someone into the kingdom? Um, I have. You, you just worry and you worry and you're like, God, please, like this person just needs to like get it together and make the right decision and they've, they've been so close and they'd be such a great asset for you, Lord. Does it work with God? What are you talking about? Everybody to God is precious. Every soul, he knits together all of them. He didn't like not knit together. Oh, some of them just kind of went AWOL and there they are. No, God, that's why life is so, it's so dynamic and precious because even if somebody is like super evil and they're doing horrible, horrible things, God still shed his blood for them. It's up to them to come 
And it's up to us to let them know that they can come. They have to come. They have to. Now, for every Paul, how many Pharisees were there that would have said, I'm not listening to this. We're not listening to the way. We don't care how much traction they're getting. And Herod should shut them down. And Caiaphas should do more. And you know that that happened. You know that they were aggressively persecuted, probably until Constantine. I mean, the, the church has been persecuted, especially off the beginning. Um, and it's persecuted like that in many, many countries in the East. But all Paul could do is write the letter. All he could do is go, guys, here it is. It's hard enough for me to tell you what I did in verse 13. It's hard enough for me to write that on this letter and let somebody actually read it. But I'm trying to get you guys to understand the gospel is so much more simple. If there's anybody who you should believe, it's me. I am throwing everything away. I went to Yuma for three years. I literally lived in Yuma. Or Gila Bend might be a better a better one. Probably a little better. There's no water there. There's no river there to, to, to swim in. Why would I do that, guys? Why would I leave Jerusalem? I had all the leverage. If I went back to Jerusalem and I and I got involved with the Pharisees again, I still would have traction. I still would have some authority to, to thump Peter on the head. I'm telling you, I got my revelation from Christ. I'm telling you that this letter is all I can do right now. I pray, I plead that you'll listen to it. I pray that you won't listen to these people. Judaism is wonderful. The law is wonderful, but it is not going to save you. You can't be saved apart from faith in Christ. That is it. And so I really want to, um, I want to just spend the last couple minutes we have in this, this idea of revelation. What is revelation? Revelation is it's the world's term. We're not going to use the world's term, but to reveal is to make known something, okay? So when we do the quote, the baby reveal, the gender reveal, what is that? Some dad shoots a shotgun that somebody gave him and it's blue. That means a baby is a male. That's awesome. Uh, or or we throw, we open up something and a proper of pink stuff comes out and you know it's a girl. That's the gender reveal. That's like, we didn't know something and now we do. That's great. What we're talking about is the personal relationship that is so often not, it's not given, it's given a lot of words. It's given a lot of lip service. But when someone says, hey, I'm really going to like seek God out about that, whatever that is, like, hey, the job's not going well and I feel like I should do something else. And they talk to a Christian brother and the brother goes, hey, man, our, where I work is hiring. Just come on over right now. Well, that might be what God has and that might not be what God has. And so you you go and you talk to the Lord. Maybe you walk out to the desert. Maybe you maybe you walk, drive up Mount Lemmon and you have a an awesome stay, a great time of prayer, a great time of just communing with God, and just hey God, I want to do this. I I I want to I want to apply at this company, or I want to move to this city, or I want to I want to become a path, whatever it is, whatever it is, God is going to show you, and that's revelation. That doesn't mean that there's new truth for you to give somebody else doesn't mean that like what God's doing in your life may be different than what he's doing in this person's life, but it will never contradict the gospel if it's actually revelation from God. Now, there's a lot of voices in this world. There's a lot of impressions in this world. There's a lot of people that rent space in our head, that, that, that push us in a direction, and maybe we're friends with this group over here, and they're loosely Christian, or they're not at all. They're just worldly. And they encourage you to do something that you're kind of like, I don't know if I should go that direction. You probably should bail out. But the first thing you need to do is go, you know what? I'm going to seek the Lord about that. Because, because nowadays people hardly hear that. And they go, seek the Lord. What does that mean? Door open. Share. It's awesome. It's, it's like when someone asks you, tell me why you would. Well, then you can start from the beginning with the gospel and you can share that is one of the reasons why. Testimony. This testimony, how many millions of people have been blessed by Galatians? Who knows, man? But it was written to arguably six, seven, eight churches maybe in this area. But it's a, it's a powerful punt. And we're going to get into the, the defense of the gospel next week and, and more. But just this, this to say, Paul stayed out in the desert 
for three years. I don't know how many of us could do that if God's like, hey, move to Gila Bend, but not to a house. I just want you to live in a tent and listen to me. There's very few Pauls on this planet, guys. There's very few people that would be like, yes, I want this. Now, where Paul had come from, where Paul had sometimes that past helps fuel somebody's willingness to go like, I don't even care about anything in this life except for whatever you say, Jesus, because look at his former life. He thought he had won the lottery in Judaism and Jesus had shown him, you have nothing without me. You literally have nothing without me. So once again, in a day with no social media, in a day with no budgets, in a day with no pictures, all Paul had was his letter. And these people had no idea. These churches, they, I mean, word traveled, obviously, but they didn't know anything about this guy yet. And that was, to me, I think that's to, to the church's advantage. Lastly, Paul's motive was pure. It was pure because even when he was doing the worst persecuting, he believed he was doing it for Yahweh. He believed he was doing it to, to elevate Judaism. That's what the Old Testament law and the traditions would have led him to conclude. Be zealous for God. Go take these blasphemers. And what, what should we do with a blasphemer? Well, we should put him to death. At least we should put him on trial. Go do it. I'll go to Damascus. I'll walk there. Okay, you're the crazy one. And, and the high priest is happy to give you the, the arrest warrant to go. So it wasn't that he was doing it because he just hated people. He was doing it because he was, in his mind, he was doing it for God, but he was, he was misguided and he was ignorant. And he even says that, I was ignorant. When called out, when called out, when called out by Jesus, he turned immediately and said, what do you want me to do, Lord? That revealed his motive. Okay, if I think I'm doing this for you and you say I'm not, then I want to do what, it, what I need to do for you. Okay, go to the desert. You got it. Once again, guys, that's a tall ask. That is a tall ask when we have the society we're in where we have tie downs and stuff and bank accounts and what about a utility bill? What about all these things? No, Paul was like, he was a light traveler, man. It's a good thing in this world. Two kind of closing thoughts. We always need to check our heart. We always need to check our motive. We always need to direct, have, have God direct our motives. I had to make a difficult phone call uh, recently, and I'm like, God, please, just please, like, guide me. I don't want to get heated in this. I don't want to get rough in this. And it worked out. It was, it was, it was as good as it could have gone. And knowing that you need that is is kind of half the battle here. Secondly, God may lead us away from the city. He may lead you away from a job. He may lead you away from prosperity, worldly prosperity, to go to the desert for a little while, to go to the wilderness for a little while, where we can only hear his voice and not, you've got mail, or another voice, which I heard that this week. I thought it was hilarious. Um, we are Guys, we are distracted people. We are loaded up with stuff. We're loaded up with cares and worries, and no, there's no, there's no reason to think that people wouldn't be anxious, stressed, scared out. Seriously, there's just so much thrown on us. Like it's it's American to be busy. It's American to to have so much going on. That's just an American thing. There are tons of cultures around this world that they don't they don't do one tenth of what we do in a day, and they're they're more satisfied. They're more fulfilled just because it's like why would you why would you do that? Why would you enter the rat race? Why would you do that? Why would you do that to yourself? The, the stress level is a very, very cool thing, what Paul was asked to do. Yes, it's hard. It's hard to obey that type of a call because it's not going to be comfy. I promise you that. The desert is rarely comfy. Boondocks, the away from everything, it's very, very uncomfortable. It is very scary sometimes. But God, if God leads, he's going to provide. He's going to make a way, and he's going to provide a way out. And Paul had not just the way out, but I think we can I think we can look at Paul's body of work and go, those three great investment years in, in wilderness seminary with Jesus, the rabbi teacher, right? Amen. All right, let's pray. Uh, Father God, we uh we thank you for your leading, and we thank you, Lord, that uh, we can open this scripture and we can see the motive of someone that's truly interested in following you first 
in, in their life. Now, God, there are many, many Americans that just struggle with uh, prioritizing you, prioritizing church, prioritizing things in their lives because they've just bought into you, you need to be busy or you need to be doing 85 things. But God, that we would listen first and foremost every day to your voice. Now that we would uh, just, that we would yield to your Holy Spirit. And God, uh, if we're not doing that, then we would just that we would just check back in with you and repent and come back. And just come back to that still small voice, Lord. Um, I pray that we would not only do that this week, Lord, but that we would that we would just invest in our relationship, that we would commune with you this week in that. And God, that we would be there for our brothers and sisters in Jesus' name.